thank you very much, Daniel, for having accepted our invitation. We have been following up uh, with really uh, the most attention what you have been doing for the ethic committees. I think that you are aware that uh, the proposal to settle down uh, an ethic committee interinstitutionally independent was one of the outcome of a very big petition that we have been organized uh, against the Barroso Barroso Gates. Gates. Uh, we were really happy to see the Parliament supporting the request. Uh, I remember to have been discussing <clears throat> in all details with the, with the former president, uh, Mr. Schulz. And we were also glad to see on 19 this proposal to be on the political commitment of all the candidates for the chairmanship of the commission. Um, we will manage eventually to have this committee settled down on 24 after five years after Bar Barroso Gate, uh, Qatar Gate, and now Russian Gate. Uh, one could say it's better never late than never, uh, but still. Uh, it's not what we were expecting, but I mean, we are now discussing with you. We have also been really happy when the, the, the parliament under your leadership has issued the first resolution. That was actually the committee that we were aiming at. Uh, strong investigation powers also dealing eventually with concerns of the senior managers. We are now with a solution that is not exactly what the parliament has proposed, but we have now understood that is the best possible agreement that can be reached. Uh, we have also seen some criticism around uh, about the result. I got several questions from colleagues when the, our notice was published, but I propose that perhaps you, you will present your views on, on the results, on the negotiation, your insider uh, views on uh, who is doing what and what has been done in order to, to get the result. And then we can discuss on questions raised by the colleagues that you can enlighten us. So thank you very much. Floor, it's yours, Daniel. Thanks so much uh, for for having me and, and on this topic. Uh, I mean, I, I remember working uh, with the staff unions when I was still at Transparency International around uh, Bar Barroso Gate. Uh, it's around that time that uh, within TI we developed this idea also after some of the research that I had done on revolving doors, on uh, the problems with the uh, ethics infrastructure, let's say, particularly also in the parliament that we said, look, it needs an independent body to, to oversee this because in many instances, the rules that we have in the commission, in the parliament, in the EU institutions, they're actually on paper quite good. We have cooling off periods, we have strong codes of conduct, we have all kinds of transparency obligations, uh, you know, both for commissioners and members of parliament. But the, the biggest problem I always saw is that when someone breaks those rules, nothing ever happens. Uh, and for th that's where this proposal came from. All the lead candidates, as you said, in 2019 signed on to this. None of them became uh, commission president, but when the council proposed Ursula von der Leyen, I contacted her immediately and asked if if she would support the proposal as well as Manfred Weber had done and, and all the other lead candidates. And uh, she she did say yes. So so then I became the the rapporteur then in the in the parliament. I wrote the proposal as 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 you said. I I I felt like already there. I made lots of concessions, having had in mind something along the lines of what the French have put in place with the Haute Autorité pour la Transparence dans la Vie Publique. But I know of all the legal challenges and let alone the political challenges with uh, setting something up uh, that, that resembles that. I, I think what we agreed on in the parliament was, was still a, a, a viable compromise, let's say, uh, and, and then nothing happened. Uh, for for quite a while, the the, the commission basically didn't really react uh, to, to our proposal, and it then took uh, the, the the biggest corruption scandal that we've seen in the European Parliament. And I guess I mean let's let's see what the Belgian courts make of this, uh, but possibly in the EU institutions um, to to move this file forward. We had a proposal of of the commission that didn't really have much to do with an independent ethics oversight. It was just a standard setting committee where the institutions would talk uh, ab about their respective rules. 
I think what we have now managed in these negotiations to, to combine the two, right? We have a standard setting body, but we also have a structure that can, can at least look at individual cases when it comes to, I mean, I, I, I don't think anyone can still call this investigative powers, but the, I, I always speak of the right to Google uh, and the right to read uh, the newspaper. Uh, so, so that is there. It's, it's up to, to the individual institutions to refer those cases. It's uh, also the, the body has no sanctioning power. Um, so, so all this remains with the institutions. Nevertheless, I think it can be a step forward in, in the ethics infrastructure of the EU institutions. It's the first time that we have negotiated an inter-institutional agreement with eight institutions. Uh, the European Council has, I, I don't know for what reason, but decided not to be part of this. Uh, they never really participated in the in the negotiations, and then just before the last round of negotiations, basically confirmed that they were not going to join this. Um, th there had been lots of fight till the end, particularly with the council, because the council has basically taken the approach uh, that you know they don't really want to be concerned by any of this. The only office holder in a way that they have put forward as to be covered is the high representative, which is already covered through its commission head. So it's kind of useless, but they nevertheless want full rights in uh, blocking or approving uh, the common standards to be adopted. And at least on paper, they want to be a full member, but they don't want to have any of the effects. Uh, so for a long time, uh, the institutions were united in not allowing that because obviously if it doesn't concern them, they shouldn't block us from adopting certain standards. But uh, th there was a change of mind in, in the commission on this one, on the on the last meters of, of negotiation. So basically at that point now, um, you know, having just been appointed now the, the rapporteur as well for the ratification, so to speak, within the European Parliament, I'm now before the decision of swallowing that you know, that the council basically gets a veto, but uh, isn't concerned by any of that or or risking that the whole project gets derailed. And what I am going to recommend to my colleagues is that we, we swallow that pill. And I, I think it's more important that this thing gets set up, that we have something up and running around the European elections. It's in, in terms of ethics, th this is the busiest period, right? Uh, usually, I mean, particularly election campaigns is, is usually when things come out, but there will be lots of new members of parliament. There will be new commissioners coming in after the European elections. So uh, I, I would really like to see that this new structure is, is, is operational and, and can work on, on these. Last comment I'm going to make uh, before we go into the discussion and questions that, that you guys might have. I, I thought that the staff should have been covered by this. We have seen issues, ethical issues um, on, on staff level, senior staff level as well. We have seen conflicts of interest. Uh, we have seen revolving door cases. Uh, I mean, in, in, a, in a way, the, the small, uh, I mean, it's a small part, but uh, Qatar Gate wasn't exclusively limited to the European Parliament. There was a director general in the commission as well that had gotten apparently lots of free flights from, from Qatar as well. Um, so, so I was very much in favor that, uh, that this, this new body should also be dealing with, with the questions at staff level. I've also seen as someone that has worked on, on the discharge of the institutions that you know, I mean, there are common rules with the staff regulation that apply to staff across EU institutions, yet the way that some of the provisions in the staff regulations are interpreted and applied between the Parliament, the Commission, Council can, can differ uh, somewhat. Uh, and I would have found it uh, beneficial that, um, you know, the, the exchange of how exactly to interpret or in the future reform the EU staff regulation uh, it should have been part uh, of, of this ethics body as well, but I was pretty alone. I still managed in the European Parliament to get this in, despite the reluctance of, of some colleagues. Uh, but when we entered the inter-institutional negotiations, uh, the, the Parliament was the only institution that uh, defended that line of, of covering staff as well. All other institutions said, um, no, we don't want that. 
So uh, this is something we we had to give. Uh, we we rather fought for the pot potential to look at individual cases rather than than uh, than fight for the inclusion of staff. But happy to to discuss that as well and, and where your stance exactly is 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 on that. Uh, thanks again for for inviting me. Oh, thank, thank, thank to you, Daniel. Uh, we were really glad on the first proposal uh, of the Parliament to to see that uh, it was proposed to enlarge the composition of the body, also with the staff representative, and ever was the staff member to be the one to be scrutinised. So, it was really the taking into account the, the situation in which staff representative are involved, as we are not for senior manager in the commission, at least with our co-power members, whenever it comes to have uh, work after the, the end, or even during the activities. Uh, perhaps what could be helpful for the colleagues, because the, the final outcome and the final composition and the remit of this uh, ethic body has not been duly announced. Um, so if you can just uh, resume in a few words how this committee will be composed, which are really the task, uh, how one could eventually submit a, a request to the committee and what document this committee is going to to scrutinize because i mean several reaction of your fellow M uh, meps uh, and make a bit of confusion about i mean uh, the, the most important confusion is uh, when you say yourself that you consider the ethic body would have eventually prevent the cutter gate and some other are mentioning not at all even with this ethic body Qatar gate could happen again in the future. So I think that is the, the most important political message to be addressed, not only to the staff, but also to the European uh, citizens. Yeah. So basically, uh, this, this ethics body is going to be composed of, of two groups of people. Um, one group is, is one representative per participating institution, so eight members uh, that are usually sort of at vice president level or one, you know, appointed member of, of those institutions. Um, this is the part that, that you know, where, where the standard setting happens. So if, if the eight institutions now agree on, on certain standards, um, I, I don't know that there should be uh, declarations of financial interest of members that should contain this, this and this information. Uh, you know, then then this is the group of people that negotiates that and then takes it back into their individual uh, institution for for adoption. But the body is also composed by five independent experts. Uh, they should not be sitting members of any of the institutions. Uh, we have defined a number of criteria. You know that they should have expertise in in this area. They should be independent. Uh, their reputation beyond doubt. And, and so on, but it leaves it open. I mean, one could imagine, I don't know, former judges of the ECJ or uh, members of, of national uh, ethics bodies or, you know, former members of the institutions that have uh, worked on this, something like that. And this is the part uh, where, where the individual cases would be sent. So for a case to end up in front of the ethics body, it, it needs an institution to send it. And, you know, we, we cannot send on behalf of other institutions. Uh, so the parliament cannot, in a way, drag a commissioner before the ethics body. It always has to come out of the institution itself. The institution can then decide that they refer a certain case. And it says in the in the agreement now that if if this is a particularly important or difficult case or one that might create an important precedent. So it, it also kind of indicates that not every case uh, should go uh, to to the ethics body, um, but if the this, uh, the institution decides to to send a case, then it goes to those five independent experts, and they make a, a recommendation. That recommendation is all confidential and is then sent back to the institution. So, in the case of Parliament, let's imagine a member of Parliament has broken the code of conduct for members that we have here. Parliament can then decide we send it to the ethics body. The ethics body finds yes. Uh, whatever uh, the, the code of conduct has been breached, they send it back to parliament president and then the parliament's president decides uh, I'm gonna sanction or not uh, this member based on the recommendation from, from the, the ethics body. 
so so the power to sanction remains with the institution it's it's all uh not none of these recommendations get get public so when you hear now that uh some of the epp colleagues are now saying that we're creating uh something akin to the disciplinary chamber uh in the uh, polish uh, constitutional court or something I, I don't really see it. I, I think this is, is fairly far-fetched. I mean, it's a, it's a body that can advise. Uh, again, I mean, they can ask questions, they can Google and read the news, but they have no investigative power whatsoever. It's not like they can search the apartment of a member or the office or any, I mean, they, they have no investigative power beyond uh, you know what you can do from a computer uh, and and, a, and an email address um yeah so it's 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 progress but you also see it's still fairly limited uh, what what this uh, what this body can actually do yeah yeah and uh, fast colleagues are really invited to put on the chat the question uh, Karina has already made it uh, but coming back to how this uh, body could have eventually prevented the Qatar gate yeah so i mean that question if if members of parliament are are willing to take bribes i'm i'm not sure anything can really prevent that if if people have such criminal energy that they they want to be bribed they they will be able to get bribes uh, you know the the police cannot prevent this uh, this ethics body clearly cannot prevent this i'm not sure there's anything that we can do to to prevent this 100% from people breaking rules and, and, and having criminal energy. What I think, what for me, this ethics body should fix is, is not that we for all future manage to, to prevent Qatar gate, but I, I would like that when people manifestly break the rules, codes of conduct rules, uh, that there is a sanction. And I think the main reason that in the past, neither in the commission nor in the parliament, people ever really get sanctioned for code of conduct violations is you know particularly in the parliament if if you're the president of parliament and you're the one that hands out these sanctions uh you know we it's not the first time in the history of the european parliament that we have a president that might toy with the idea of running for another term after the election and usually taking colleagues money away is a fairly bad election <laughs> campaign you know, and, and and so so there is an an incentive basically not to enforce the rules too much, and with this, I hope that we're making it a bit easier for the president, uh, you know, to say, look, the the independent uh, EU ethics body recommended uh, that there should be something here, so I cannot do anything else but to say, but it's it's not really me; it's the independent experts that uh, have have recommended that. So, so this is basically, I I hope the improvement that we bring to the table. When I say it cannot prevent Qatar Gate, I I think, you know, I I, I don't know what went through the mind of uh, of 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 those people when they did it, and of course they no one has been convicted as of yet. Uh, the the procedures in the in the in the Belgian judiciary are still ongoing, and we will find out eventually if if anyone is actually convicted for for anything here. I certainly hope so. Um, but I, I think what contributes to a general sense of impunity is, you know, if, if, if no one ever gets sanctions for breaking any rules, people get more cocky and think that they are untouchable. So I also think it's important also the small rules to enforce them. You know, when following Qatar Gate, there were dozens and dozens of colleagues that all of a sudden remembered, oh, I had been invited to this trip as well, and I got this gift. And, and all of a sudden, the, the number of declarations really spiked. You know, you can see Transparency International has made a little fun graph where you can see how immediately after the arrest, uh, all of a sudden, lots of colleagues remembered uh, to declare things. And, you know, in the rules, there are clear deadlines when these declarations have to be filed. Um, it's usually the end of the month following uh, when when something has taken place. And I find, you know, if you ride the bus without a ticket, even if you have a ticket at home or something, you pay 100 euros because you don't have a ticket on the bus. And, and every citizen knows that. And I think 
you know, of course, members of parliament can f forget something and they can miss a deadline for a declaration. But, you know, as much as the citizens then have to pay their fine on the bus, members of parliament should pay a fine when they forget to make their declarations. And I think that will very much incentivize people to file their declarations on time. But, but this culture of impunity where no one ever gets punished, uh, I, I think it contributes to a general sense of, oh, th those rules are either for others or they're not to be taken too, uh, too much by the word. And, and I think this is wrong. Uh, I, I, I think that should change. And I hope on that one, uh, this, this ethics body can, you know, help us to, to improve the culture in our institutions. I mean, we, we can only agree on what you mentioned, and we also know that in, even inside the institution, whenever you say what you have just said, you don't become so popular. Uh, everyone try to, to say uh, that, uh, to criticize colleagues, uh, even member of the institution, is in a way undermining the reputation. Whenever we, we mention leading by example, it's not just an empty refrain. Uh, the reaction even from some colleagues are, not that positive because everyone seems to be more concerned about the reputation but the, actually the reputation is bad because as you have just mentioned no one is punished rules are not clear uh, before coming to the question perhaps on rules because i think that one of the mission of this body would also be to harmonize and to clarify ethic rules because sometimes no one can be punished because rules are not clear. And especially, I know that you have been working a lot, even with Transparency International, on conflict of interest and revolving door. Do you think that this committee will finally clarify what is totally unacceptable as a, as a revolving door and to become lobbyist, especially against your own former institution, as Mr. Barroso has done? I, I clearly hope so. Um, but I would also caution that that I don't think that there is this, you know, easy thing that once you write a couple of sentences of this is the conflict of interest, that this question is forever settled. You know, I, I have been, um, when I was still with TI, I was invited by the US government um, to, to sort of uh, visit uh, a few US institutions on, you know, questions around transparency. And, and one of the things I got on this trip is I got the ethics manual of, uh, of the US Senate, which is an, I, I'm looking whether I still have it somewhere here in my office, but it's an 800 page, super uh, thick book. And, and basically these questions, I mean, it's basically people come up with weird things to circumvent rules or with strange new ideas of, you know, where everyone would think, oh, that cannot be legal, but it's it's not covered in the in the current rules. So so I fear that this is also an ongoing work where you have to look at, uh, you know, someone comes up with a new idea and then you have to deal with uh, how, how do you, you know, do you have to change the rules? Do you have to adapt the rules or just interpret them uh, in a way that it says uh, th this is clearly not allowed? But it's an ongoing work. And I, I hope that the ethics body can, can contribute to, to improving that, that even when we encounter new uh, phenomena or, or new ideas of uh, how to become richer while you're already getting a decent salary, um, you know, how, how, how this can be uh, contained let's let's say um but 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 yes it's it's not a one one off we define this and then it's forever it's forever settled i mean also the question of revolving doors you know this is always and you have to look at each individual case uh you know some activities are completely fine to do right after you leave office some activities are even fine to do while you're in office but yet others are are hugely problematic and i actually think you know, I mean, some some revolving doors should never happen. Uh, you know, I, I I always say the Canadians actually came up with with a lifelong prohibition to change sides. That you know, the the kind of case that, for example, the former German Chancellor Gerhard Schröder did, where while you're in office you negotiate a pipeline, and then when you leave office you become the CEO uh, of of the pipeline company. I think something like that should basically never happen. Not not one year not two years after you leave office never but then obviously people you know uh, are not going to spend 
hopefully their entire life in politics, they need to be able to do certain things. And, and we have to determine on a case by case basis, you know, what activities are okay at what point in time, or, or do we need special provisions, you know, that they don't lobby, that they don't uh, call back uh, their, their former colleagues or subordinates or so on. Um, and, and I think that's, that's where the ethics body can play a role in, in, in making these very personal individual arrangements. Thank you, Daniela. Uh, we will go through the question raised. Uh, Karina is asking how this ethic body will interact with OLAF uh, whenever yeah. is a breach of provisional staff regulation, ethics related to answer. Yeah. So I, I, I think, I mean, to start maybe with EPO, uh, with the European yeah. Public Prosecutor or, or National uh, Prosecution Services, I think there it's very easy. Anything that uh, concerns uh, basically penal law. Uh, is is not for the ethics body. The ethics body deals with questions around the codes of conduct uh, of of the respective institutions. So anything that is below uh, the level that uh, that gets you into jail, uh, let's say. Um, when it comes to Olaf, uh, there there is a tiny bit of work to be done uh, to make sure uh, that that you know the division of labor is is clear. The thing is, for example, in the European Parliament, Olaf has no role in enforcing uh, the, the code of conduct. So there it's, it's very easy. Um, on the commissioners, it's a bit less, less clear what role exactly o Olaf has there or has undertaken. I know that Olaf sometimes says that they, you know, they see a bigger role on this for themselves. Uh, but, but as I said, particularly in the Parliament, it, it just you know, so far they haven't gotten access uh, to the parliament and they have never, as far as I know, been called upon on uh, on these kind of ethics issues uh, in, inside the parliament. So so there the the division of labor is, is quite clear. And we do regret that, Daniel. Uh, we would like to yeah. see Olaf dealing with that. We have been managing to get Olaf, for example, involved in harassment cases in the commission because we do trust colleagues of Olaf as a professional making the investigation. And I think one of the requests that you could put forward is even, even to open the parliament to Olaf, because otherwise yeah. the, the perception of uh, endogamy seems to be quite clear. I mean, uh, why parliament is afraid of Olaf, uh, one could, uh, yeah. could argue. Uh, and, and, I, and I have made that proposal. I made an amendment to the discharge that we just voted last week uh, with, with exactly that request uh, and it, uh, it got a majority. So I very much hope now that the leadership of, of the parliament uh, takes uh, what also the majority of the house wants and, and does grant access to, to Olaf for, for these kind of investigations. It's kind of, I mean, it's, it's that bizarre situation where even when it comes to you know, I mean, things that are very clearly not for the ethics body, you know, but when it comes to allowance fraud or fraud with uh, travel reimbursements for members of parliament, that even when they do get a um, a tip from someone uh, with Olaf, uh, they, they cannot search, for example, a member's uh, computer. And there isn't even, uh, you know, I mean, we have in the rules of procedure of parliament, there is the possibility. I mean, I understand that colleagues say, look, uh, but, but there is parliamentary immunity, but there isn't even a procedure for Olaf to, to request the lifting of parliamentary immunity. EPO can ask for that. National prosecution services can ask for that. But Olaf basically has just no possibility to even request the lifting of, of, of immunity of members to then be able uh, you know, if immunity is lifted, to, to potentially search uh, computers or offices of, 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 of members when there is a, a sufficient indication that there might have been fraud or misuse of funds or whatever. Uh, but right now, that, that possibility just doesn't legally exist. And we were really grateful to see what you have been doing in the discharge. Uh, and thank you also for that. Um, we all, I mean, we all understand that whenever uh, this committee will deal with individual cases, uh, there will be perhaps the most political uh, moment. Um, and it's clear that what is also important is to be sure that the five independent experts will be selected under uh, full transparency and for credibility of the of the selection. So colleagues are asking how this five independent members will be selected and hired uh, they will 
also work on top of their mandate or we are dealing with all retired people that we do just uh, after their work. So being an independent expert of this ethics body is not a full time job. Um, we will have to see a bit, you know, how how much of a workload uh, there there actually is, and and might have to adapt depending on on how much work there is for these independent experts. But for now, the proposal is um, there is a joint selection by by the institutions. We have defined the criteria of who can or who cannot uh, be an independent expert. But then it's a it's a joint decision of the institutions on 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 who it could be. Uh, their status then is that they are, uh, uh, I think they basically get an AD12 contract uh, where they are paid by the day that they then actually do do work as 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 independent experts. Um, but but my expectation would very much be that, you know, I mean, some of them might be retired, but I I I would think that they have a daytime job. I don't know, maybe in the high authority. Uh, in in France, uh, and then for for a number of days a year, uh, they then function as uh, as uh, on a daily basis experts to to the independent EU ethics body. But but yeah, uh, the the selection of these experts among the institutions might still develop into a bit of a political fight of who 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 sits there. How eminent are they? Uh, how how much of a will? To actually change things, do they have, or do we just put people that think everything is uh, perfectly in order and uh, nothing to see here, uh, is a conflict uh, for for a later day, and will be somewhat determined as well, you know, by 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 the the institutional representatives uh, that that sit there, you know the. Vice President of the Commission that will be in charge of this uh, will play a role. The Vice President of Parliament uh, that that will take over this responsibility will play an important role. And and I guess uh, you know how how eager they are to to be ambitious on that or or not will will play an important role. I think that there will be more voicing. Um nearby the elections as we have been seeing in the last meeting of the college about the appointment of this new responsible for uh, uh, PME and I know that you have been following that and the parliament has taken a clear position about this election procedure and uh, every time that we see an any procedure for recruitment to be challenged uh, it's for us a sad moment because I mean uh, it's the credibility of the institution itself to, in a way, to be to be jeopardized, and I hope that the situation will be in also in this respect clarified. Uh, I also noticed that there is a lots of question about where the secretariat of the committee uh, will be put, uh, and uh, everyone seems upset about the fact that this is the commission who is uh, dealing with this secretariat. Uh, which is your views on this respect? There seems to be quite marginal, but looking at some reaction seems to be politically sensitive. <laughs> well, it is one of the attack lines now that the EPP has decided that they don't want this thing. Uh, they they use this as one of the arguments. Um, I mean, the idea that, I mean, the, the secretariat concretely is composed of one official per participating institution. And then there is a so-called, well, there is a kind of rotating presidency uh, mm. among the institutions that take the lead on leading the secretariat. And the parliament actually gets to lead first because we take the order of institutions from Article 13 and then we'll just go one, one by one. Um, now to argue that uh, because the two assistants that basically will book whatever the accommodation and the travel for, for the independent experts, that somehow that is the secret <laughs> puppet mastering of the commission of the whole operation and that they will thereby control uh, the ethics body that decides by consensus among the eight institutions, I, I think is, is reasonably far-fetched. Um, I think the the decision here was basically, uh, you know, I mean, I mean, it needs to go somewhere. We need a room uh, for, for, for this to go. The commission has offered. Uh, I don't think 
you know, I mean, we actually have the precedent of, of the transparency register, for example, they're formally speaking as well. The secretariat sits with the commission, but it's a joint secretariat of commission parliament and now also the council since the last revision. I, I have not uh, noticed that uh, thereby uh, the commission somehow secretly controls the European parliament or uh, any, any, anything like that. So I, I don't fully understand um, what what my EPP colleagues uh, are are on about on 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 this one? I have to admit. Okay, they don't trust the commission. <laughs> it's a pity. Um, now, oh, qu several questions uh, raised in the chat about is this committee in a way um, acting also on harassment uh, on something that can be directly or indirectly linked to that. I mean, it's not completely excluded because harassment cases could be seen as as violations of um, of the codes of conduct uh, in the respective institutions as well. But there there is not a dedicated mandate on 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 harassment. Uh, so how much they deal with it also depends on the common standards that we set. If uh, if common standards are set in a way that include harassment cases then yes. Uh, otherwise, it depends a bit how or not harassment is covered in the in the current rules of, of the institutions. But to say, I mean, what, what is actually the legal basis of, you know, what, what the ethics body can look at uh, when, when it comes to individual cases is that was also quite a hard fight, whether the internal rules of the respective institutions can be looked at, yes or no. Because initially, there was a proposal that only the common standards uh, could, you know, any violation of an individual could only be measured against the commonly agreed standards. And, and my fear in particular was that, you know, they might, they might be lower than the current rules that we have in this or that institution. And given that these common standards are set by consensus of all participating institutions, you know, there, there is a certain risk that we get the lowest common denominator, basically. Um, so, so, so a bit of a yes and no answer on, 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 on harassment, but yes, institutions could also refer individual cases that contain elements or, or are about harassment, uh, to, to the ethics body. All right. Another question that uh, has been, uh, also raised is the interaction we have been dealing with the interaction with EPO, national authorities and all of, um, the interaction with existing independent bodies inside each and every institution, the commission as itself, uh, the commission was announcing, uh, answering to your first proposal that should this ethic body be uh, created, they could eventually renounce, have renounced to their um, internal independent body. But now I suppose that each institution will keep its own internal body and then how this interaction between these two independents will be dealt with. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the proposal I had made in the parliament and that also got the majority was we get rid of the institutional bodies and we, in, in a way, we merge them all together and then have one jointly. I didn't get that through now in the negotiations. Now we have a weird hybrid model where everyone keeps their internal structures and then whenever they decide, they can send individual cases to to the EU body. I hope that time will push this whole model into a situation where all the cases get referred to to the EU ethics body, and that then institutions decide, yeah, okay, now we can get rid of our internal bodies because the double structure doesn't really make all all that much sense. But for now, it's it's basically, I mean, the logic that is now in the agreement is easy cases. Are, are dealt with internally, difficult, high profile cases are dealt with jointly in the, in the EU ethics body, but it will basically be determined by the participating institutions, by public pressure, uh, whether, you know, I, I could foresee that once this is created and a case does occur in the European parliament, for example, there might be members that say, Oh, this case we should now send to the EU ethics body and the next one also, and the next one after that, and then we will see uh, how, how things develop. 
Yeah, another concern that has been mentioned is the people are afraid that through these ethics bodies, the, the parliament will see uh, its power against the, not against the, but in uh, scrutinizing what would happen, for example, in the commission, uh, in the framework of the discharge to be in a bit uh, undermined. Let's imagine that there is a specific case referred to the committee, the committee adopt uh, one resolution, uh, then could the parliament still keep on criticizing the same file for example for the discharge let's imagine a procedure for appointing someone or uh, something like the barroso gate so once the the committee will issue a decision with the agreement of the vice president of the parliament who is member of the body can you see an emerge for the parliament itself to still keeping on fighting against the same file or the final outcome will be the ethic body has, has mentioned that everything is fine, so there is not, not that much that we could do. So, I mean, first of all, I mean, some of the criticism that we have heard in the parliament where now parliament loses its independence and somehow, you know, because also the secretariat is in the commission that now the commission will use this ethics body to, to somehow uh, launch lots of procedures against uh, MEPs that criticize the commission. I mean, given that the recommendations are always done by the independent experts, not any members of, of the institutions, um, given that there's five independent experts uh, that should usually decide uh, by, by consensus, I, I, I don't, understand how anyone would orchestrate that. Um, it's also then, I mean, even if the independent experts recommend, look, this guy has now broken uh, the, the code of conduct in the, in the house, the president of parliament at the end is free to follow or not uh, the, the recommendation by the ethics body. And given that the recommendation is confidential, you know, it's not even like, any, anyone knows really. I mean, you can then ask the president, did you follow the recommendation? Yes or no, but there, there's no way for anyone to really know, um, you know, what's what's in the recommendation Did the president follow yes or no. So I think the the reduction of freedom of the president of the European parliament is, is fairly hypothetical. Um, you know, the president is free at the end. She might have to justify her decision, but that she might have to do whether or not there is an, uh, an ethics body. Um, so, so I'm not sure that that's such uh, um, a, a bad thing. I, I don't think that it completely reshapes the institutional balance. I, I don't think that this has any impact on, you know, the, the role of the budget control committee or the discharge or the criticism we might have politically on, on, on this or that member of the commission or any, I, I really don't see how uh, a procedure here would interfere with that. Uh, we have, I mean, the parliament wanted it differently, but the, the commission has f fought very hard to exclude, for example, the declarations of commissioners designate from any analysis by the ethics body. So one of the things that parliament actually with the experience of the last uh, nomination of commissioners wanted to change, you know, that we can get an independent uh, position on, is this a conflict of interest? Yes or no. Th this is now just not happening because the commission really didn't want it. I, I think, you know, if, if, I mean, let's take the case, whatever, there's a Hungarian commissioner. I think there's a conflict of interest. I, it would have been sent to the ethics body and the ethics body then comes back and says, no, actually, we don't think there is a conflict of interest. You know, then me as a member, I couldn't have made that argument as, as forcefully. I could then still say politically, I think this person is not qualified to be a commissioner and I could have continued my fight. Uh, yeah against the uh, randomly taken example of a Hungarian commissioner that might have uh, an ethics issue. Um, yeah, but I, I think, you know, I, I would still prefer a system where I have that independent it, input, uh, you know, and then I know whether I can still make the, the more legal argument of a conflict of interest or whether I have to make a political argument that I think that person is unfit. Yeah, now uh, there is also a question, uh, uh... If the ethic body has the power to enforce its own recommendation, but I think that is not 
but uh, can you yeah, imagine? No, for no, the, no, yeah. no, not really. No. Um, I mean, if if we now go into a situation where routinely uh, the recommendations are ignored, I think we will have to uh, have a conversation uh, at some point down the line. You know, I mean, then this body is useless. So I would very much hope that by the seniority, by the credibility of the process and, and the, the individuals involved, that these recommendations are actually followed. Um, one of the last fights we had was, uh, you know, if this ethics body gets an annual report, will they be able to say things like our recommendations are routinely ignored? Um, so, so they will be able to say that in their annual report. Um, they won't be able to, you know, speak about individual cases or drop concrete names and stuff, but they will be able to say, look, we dealt with 15 cases and in seven, our recommendations were followed. And, you know, then we can all draw the necessary conclusions uh, about this. Yeah, uh, Karina is asking what kind of administrative investigation powers will have this body. Uh, for, for, for example, uh, if something is not clear, uh, a part of Googling, is there anything that could, could have eventually be done in order to more, to clarify? I, I think one of the things they, that we might achieve with this is there are uh, certain declarations available at national level, uh, sometimes out of previous positions that people have held or, uh, you know, because MEPs, I mean, in France, we have that case, but those declarations are public, but they, you know, they file two sets of declarations, one with the high authority, one with the European Parliament. But in some member states, these kind of national declarations might be uh, not just on the internet for everyone to see, but might be confidential. And then here, maybe uh, the ethics body can write a letter to, I don't know, the Croatian uh, National Parliament uh, Declaration Office and ask, could we please see uh, the declaration of this or that member? And then, you know, maybe when they get a, a more official request from the EU ethics body, maybe some of them will actually answer those and, and, and provide information that is maybe not just openly available on, on the internet. But as I said, th there is no search warrant possibility. There is no uh you know they don't get to use pegasus or other ways <laughs> of uh of uh, spying on people or listening to their phone calls or, or anything like that those are instruments uh, that are limited to prosecutors police uh, and, and 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 our intelligence services no. uh, having that you are really the last question to to whom address uh, the disappointment because i mean we were so happy about your first proposal and it's clear that what is the final outcome is not really up to the the standard of the, your first proposal and we really recognize that you have done whatever it was possible to be done but if you really see today even the reaction to the the last uh, proposal uh, i could understand easily how bad what how hard you have been discussing with all these actors around the table uh, because Lorenzo was mentioning that perhaps it would have been simpler to to give all the power to Olaf instead of setting these new ethic bodies uh, I think that the two mandates are not the same um, and I suppose that you you are still convinced that it's better to have this body than nothing and I'm convinced that you 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 rely on the fact that once you start with something then uh, political opinion and eventually mistakes could improve the the situation in the future i mean if you if you look at the the different elements of transparency and and ethics infrastructure around the eu institutions this is how it has gone in the past uh, right it's it's sometimes you know for people like me it's painfully slow I still think on most things it's it's moving in the right direction, you know, that we got a, a lobby register something, uh, you know, has been going on for, I think, 13 years now uh, that the, the first lobby register was created between Parliament and, and the Commission. It has been successively improved. It's still not perfect. Uh, I, I think there's still much to be done, but, you know, it's it's continuously moving in that direction. It's impossible in these kind of inter-institutional uh, settings to to jump too far. There's too many 
forces of inertia. There is too many lawyers with lots of concerns <laughs> involved and, and too, too few people that, that have a, a vision in mind where they want to go and, uh, and, and really want to you know, use political capital and, and, and fight for it. So I, I, I think it's a start. Uh, it, it will be disappointing when we see the first cases and then hopefully we can use uh, the next scandal to make the next step uh, forward. I would have uh, maybe preferred to avoid one or two scandals along the way, but uh, this, this is the way it unfortunately has to go. The question of, shouldn't we just have the, given all of this to, to Olaf? Um, I have to admit, I generally have some questions on how well Olaf functions. Uh, I'm, I'm very happy that we have managed to introduce the European public prosecutor. I, I think, you know, for me, that is a more promising route than the whole Olaf investigates, then hands it over to a national uh, prosecutor. And, and we all know the statistics that, that half the cases basically get lost in this handover. I still cannot fully tell. Uh, you know, how much is to be blamed on Olaf, how much is to be blamed on national prosecutors. But what we, I think, can all see is that the system is is not really functioning. You know, when half the work doesn't lead anywhere, there is lots of waste. And uh, yeah, and I, I think, I mean, Olaf is, 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 is good for, for questions around money and, and mismanagement and Broad and allowance problems and all this, but I, I I'm, I'm less convinced that they are the right institution when it really comes to hard ethical, uh, you know, should a certain follow up job after having left office, is, is, is this now a good job to take or no, is, is, is a very different question than has Daniel Freund properly submitted all his requests for travel reimbursement or, you know, uh, or, or, or not. So, so all this led me uh, to 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 the point where I said, you know, I, I I think the the independent ethics body is is the better structure for these kind of code of conduct questions rather than Olaf. I, I think they can very much assist in in some of the investigations, and if ever the ethics body finds something that that is more in the domain of Olaf, I, I would hope that they just hand over or or to Apple, uh, depending on what exactly the case is. Um, and, and that they work well together, uh, but but I think the the route that we have taken now is 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 the more promising one. Uh, Franco is asking which, in your personal opinion, the best possible ethics body. I suppose that is more or less what you have been putting forward on the first proposal. Yeah, I mean my my initial proposal to the Parliament, um, you know, in in the in the legal framework, I I, I think. You know, the, the example that we see with the high authority in France is something that, you know, if, if I could change the, the current treaties as I, as I please is something that I would see. So, so rather a magistrate, uh, you know, uh, an investigative judge uh, to, to, to take this over and be able to, to launch procedures to be able in, in case of severe violations of the rules to be able to, to bring the stand in front of court uh, and the possibility to launch uh, proper police uh, investigations if, if, if need be. You know, that particularly in terms of investigative powers that the French can look into um, tax declarations, into land ownership, into, you know, to request uh, whatever um, documents pertaining to uh, to bank accounts to verify, you know, su suspicious payments or, or something um, that that would be, you know, an I ideal scenario that uh, unfortunately I fear uh, would be needed for, for, for some of the individuals here. There are very few, most of the people work very hard and are clean and are really trying uh, their, their very best. And I also believe, you know, that this is true across uh, the, the political spectrum, but it is ultimately a few individuals that uh, ruin all of our institution's reputation. Um, and, and this is equally a problem for us as members, as for you as uh, civil servants, uh, you know, that, that a few individuals ultimately ruin the reputation of of, of the EU, 
Um, and, and, and that's why I think a system like that in an ideal world uh, would, would, would be better. <laughs> yeah. Um, many guys is uh, more concerned about possible abuse in interpretation of the rules. I suppose that is just voicing what some of your colleagues are mentioning that the independence of the parliament will be undermined by this committee. Um, let's imagine it's someone who would consider that the opinion of the external expert is unfair. Uh, is this person entitled to challenge the, the opinion somewhere in front of any authority? So, I mean, since since the the ethics body only makes a recommendation, um, the the possibilities to challenge remain the same as they are now. Um, I actually don't know in detail how it works in all institutions, but I mean, for the European Parliament, um, the the power to sanction members in the Parliament lies exclusively with the president. And there is then the possibility to challenge that internally. If you get sanctioned by the president, you can uh, launch an appeal with the borough of the European Parliament. And if that fails uh, and you still think uh, that your rights were violated or that you're unjustly uh, sanctioned, you always have the possibility to go to the European Court of Justice and, and, and challenge any, any EU decision in, 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 the, in the respective court. And I would suspect that it is somewhat similar in in the other institutions um but the 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 decision to sanction or to take any kind of consequence lies not with the ethics body so the the ethics body recommendation in a way has has legally i mean has no effect it is a recommendation to the respective institutions yes or no your internal rules have have been violated yes or no but um yeah on on the on the appeal in a way nothing changes to how it is right now and finally do you expect the parliament to endorse the results of the negotiation despite the clear opposition of uh, some political groups i would think so um and we, we had a first, in a way, test vote in the Constitutional Affairs Committee when the decision was taken to appoint a rapporteur for ratification. Uh, the vote was tight, uh, but it, it confirmed me as, uh, as rapporteur. Uh, we will see how exactly, you know, I mean, committees and, and plenary votes can, can sometimes uh, differ a bit. My prediction would be, I mean, this is going to be one, if not the last vote of, of this legislature, you know, uh, the, the, the final Strasbourg Thursday, possibly where, where we vote this at the end of the month uh, in, in about two weeks time. Um, and, I, you know, I mean, we're in the, we're, we're the election campaign has started, people will have to think uh, twice whether what I think is one of our main answers to Cuttergate whether you you now just before the election, you know, stand in the way of this and say no, no, I'm I'm against this, but you know, I mean, th this is for a, a question mainly for the EPP. I'm fairly confident that the Social Democrats uh, renew us Greens and uh, and the left will 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 confirm uh, this. So so there will be a majority. How broad it is, uh, be beyond these four. Uh, groups, colleagues still have to decide, I guess. Um, they're, they're, they're trying to make these arguments. I'm not sure they're particularly convincing. So I, I, my, my impression is there will be some, some conservatives as well in the end uh, that, that might uh, vote in favor of this also given, given the scheduling. Um, we, I mean, already when I voted my report uh, initially in, 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 in the parliament in, in 21, uh, it wasn't actually my fault, but the, the German EPP colleague, uh, through his procedural motions, uh, uh, pushed the vote so that it just took place 10 days before the last national elections in Germany, which then made it impossible uh, for the German conservatives to vote against it. Um, <laughs> they, they ended up abstaining, although they had made it very clear in all the debates and the negotiations uh, that they hated uh, everything yeah. about this ethics body. So, um, 
let's let let's see but i i'm fairly confident that we that we get a a, a broad majority for for the adoption of this because what that is a bit surprising is that those who are not going to support and not those who consider that this uh, final compromise uh, is a bit not up to the needs but those who challenge the compromise to be too strong. I mean, actually, I really don't see how one could consider uh, that this final outcome can be so so dangerous for uh, any kind of uh, independence or other. So it seems more to be a political posture, uh, not that popular, actually, as you have rightly mentioned. So it's clear that there is no no longer much of maneuver for improving the, the compromise. So it's a take it or leave it. So you have yeah. been clear on this respect. And let's imagine that the parliament will adopt it and the whole institution will finally also endorse. When will the ethic body be put in place on your revision? So I, I I don't have an exact date yet. Um, obviously, first, all the institutions need to ratify, but I think we as parliament are rather the most complicated ones uh, to, to, to ratify the agreement. Um, we, we have by far the most members. For, for many others, it's, uh, it's just a borough or college or, I mean, a much smaller group of people that can quickly um, you know, adopt the agreement. Um, I would very much hope that we're operational around the EU elections, um, but but an exact date uh, we will have to see. It's then again, I mean, from the Parliament's point of view, it's a bit, uh, you know, we need to appoint a vice president that uh, that that sits on this body, and uh, while everyone is campaigning, uh, you know, these kind of uh, things are not super easy to do, but I would very much hope uh, that Parliament's president takes an active role to make sure, you know, that we are not blocking anything and that uh, all, all this can happen as, as as soon as possible. I will certainly, you know, once this is adopted uh, in, in in plenary as, as rapporteur and as one of the negotiators recommend to her uh, that she takes the necessary steps as, as soon as possible. And so far I have seen uh, Roberta Metzola as a as an ally in in this fight uh, for 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 the ethics body. So I'm I'm pretty sure she she'll do everything she can uh, to to make this move uh, as as quickly as possible. Yeah, I think that we are really uh, to to recognize that President Metzola has acted a clear, uh, straightforward role in the culture gate. I think it is important that not only staff but also citizens can rely on one person that seems to be really aware about how bad is the perception of the of the rest of the world about what is going on. Uh, we also notice that there are some discussion about leaving the lifting the immunity. Uh, for some is a privilege, for some other is the, the proof that the parliament is not strong enough, but I think that immunity cannot become something that make an obstacle to make things clear. Uh, yeah. other, otherwise, is the really the reputation, the credibility of the institution itself that is jeopardized. So we have also really appreciated that things have been made clear. Uh, I think finally we can regret that the investigation made at the Belgium level doesn't doesn't seem to be so straightforward. There are some incidents that are a bit worrying, but I mean, as you have mentioned, no one is convicted so far. Uh, but I think that on, on ethic and field, things are already clear. I mean, there are breach of rules at the ethical level, they are clear, then we will see the criminal law is also concerned. Uh, yeah. But but it's also important that Political responsibility is not always mixing up with criminal responsibility. There are things that can be decided by a judge, but there are others that are more in the field of ethics, and, and you can breach ethics rules without breaching the, the criminal law. Uh, it is important to make that clear. So, yeah. Daniel, uh, we can only hope that to see you again in the European Parliament. Uh, our dream would be that you are appointed this vice president in this ethic body because then we will have the guarantee that the ethic body will work. <laughs> and we we thank well, you again for for being with us uh, and for what you you do in order to protect the credibility of the institution and of the staff. Well, thanks thanks so much. Uh, well, there is an election campaign. Uh, 
between now and, <laughs> and, and this potentially happening. It's up to to you as well as voters uh, to, to decide who, who you send to parliament. Uh, I'm, I'm running again. Uh, I have a decent chance uh, to to be re-elected. Uh, if if I am uh, re-elected, I will not stop uh, pestering everyone uh, with uh, with these kind of things. I can promise, uh, you know, I, I will not shut up when when people break or fiddle with the rules. Um, it doesn't always make me friends, uh, but I you know I can't really change that about myself uh, it's for voters to decide if they want to have people like me in the parliament um so i'll i'll i'll, I'll do my best um what, one thing i still wanted to say I, I i think this is a you know despite all the shortcomings uh, on on the details of this ethics body I, it's it's still you know what makes me proud about this is uh, we, we don't have too many cases of things originating in the parliament and then seeing the light of day, you know, we, we still don't have the right of initiative, but he, here in this case, we kind of got it, right? It is a, a, a parliament proposal. Uh, then the commission came with something that was not not that, but, you know, something is now happening based based on a parliament proposal. So, so I think uh, still, Still, something that that is ultimately good for for the European Parliament, but it also shows, you know, that it's it's ultimately down uh, to to individuals, and it's it's a power struggle as well. You know, who gets to be rapporteur when we fought? Who gets to negotiate this? Um, you know, that as as rapporteur, uh, you then need to be policed uh, by by two other negotiators, so so that you uh, you know. Uh, don't don't do things that uh, some people in the parliament would would not like you know those those are the kind of battles that are normal in in in, in politics but i think you know across political groups uh, th this is not only a greens thing now um we we worked well together uh, as as parliament negotiators to to get something from this so i i think overall this um this has been you know shows that it, it's slow, yes, but but Parliament can can make progress, and and I hope also uh, reply somewhat adequately to 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 the issues that we have seen also in in this house. And then last word, because you have mentioned us as well, and I hear it here in the Parliament as well. There are colleagues, including in my own group, uh, that fear uh, you know talking too much about this or uh, you know discussing the individual cases uh, can can harm the reputation. I don't believe in sweeping things under the rug. I know cleaning up corruption and, and cleaning up when, when things go wrong can be painful uh, and can in the first reaction lead to a, to a loss of trust, trust and, and reputation. But I think ultimately the more sustainable approach is you do clean it up. Otherwise it will always come back uh, to bite you uh, again. So, so I think it's, it's important um, you know that we take the necessary steps we cannot do that alone as parliament but i think here we have we have taken a good step in the right direction uh, of course and uh, we will share your uh, promise we are not going to shut up either uh, perhaps you didn't make uh, lots of friends but we are proud to be among your friends and to support your activities now in in the future and, and we do share your own concerns uh, to hide things, uh, to deny what cannot be defined, it is the, the word service that we can give to our institution, their credibility, uh, the credibility of the staff, we are not going to, to, to shut up about it. So thank you very much, Daniel. Get in touch. Thanks. Bye. Bye.